Well, hi folks, and welcome along to this, the first episode of the Nan Kenki podcast. I'm your host today, my name's Ian Finlayson, Secretary at Nan Kenki. Uh, this podcast is given to you by Zion Energy, the leading blockchain software and digitalization experts leading the field in emerging technologies related to oil and gas tokenization. More information, go to zion.com. So folks, I'm, I'm particularly delighted to be joined today by my friend and the director of football from Nairn County, Mr. Glenn McLeod. Hello, Glenn. Welcome along. Hi, Ian. Thanks for having me. Always a pleasure, mate. You know that. Uh, I, I guess the first question to ask you is, how are things in the lockdown? How are you finding things? How's the family? Yeah, it's, um, it's different, I think, as it is for everyone, but... Um, and we're all kind of longing to get back to normality, aren't we? But uh, you know, everyone's well, everyone's fit, everyone's healthy. Um, my fiance is still working, and uh, the wee man's off school, and I'm I'm able to work from home with him. So it's a, a, a you know, I count your blessings on on that front a bit. But I, mean, I think it's a small price to pay um, compared to what's going on elsewhere in the world, and the you know the other troubles that a lot of people find themselves in. Yeah, that's the main thing. You can't buy health, I guess, isn't it? Absolutely, yeah. Um, this is the, the first episode of the, the County Podcast where we hope to bring all the, the fans out there some information, and up-to-date uh, news on, on what's happening at the club and also have interviews with people such as yourself who are at the beating heart of all football things at Station Park. Um, so tell me, how, how has lockdown affected what we do at County? How are the how the team, how's Lodi the manager? Yeah, it's obviously had a massive impact, Ian. You've, you've gone from um, looking at, I think we had eight or nine games remaining and, and looking at that and trying to pick the lock, if you like, as to how we're going to maximise our sort of points return from those fixtures to the, the whole thing being wiped out completely. And you've gone from looking at, going from that to, to thinking how, how did the players keep themselves ticking over. I mean, the, the main, the, the big thing, I suppose, Ian, is that there's no precedent. There's nothing that you can go and look at and say, well, the last time there was a global pandemic or last time football got shut down for for months on end, this was what we did. And, yeah. and refer to that, there's no reference point at all. We're, we're completely in the dark. There's nothing that we know that the, the man in the street doesn't know about when football's going to come back or when, when they're not going to be playing again. I think the supporters will probably know at the same time as we do, there's 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 no there's not going to be any sort of hidden announcement or anything confidential filtered down that, to say look we're looking at getting things going on this date. We really are in the dark. Um, the players, that's, the, that's maybe the question we get asked the most, isn't it? Just when are you yeah. going to start playing football again? What's... Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, the players are absolutely chomping at the bit just to get back to training. Never mind playing. I think players are very resilient by nature, and I don't. I'm not saying we're unique in that with our players. I think just players in general just want to play football. Players don't get hung up or get involved in any of the other issues or concerns that surround a football club. The players just want to get out in the park and play and get out in the training field and train and, and be amongst the, the squad, be be together. Um, and obviously, all that's been taken away from them. So. The guys are to keep themselves ticking over as best they can. They're just kind of left to their own devices on that. It's you know they're very they look after themselves very well. They're very professional in their approach to their training and their fitness and their health. So you know the guys are all looking after themselves. Yeah, um, the, the feedback you're getting from them is they're all doing okay. And yeah, I'm in touch with them. I'm in touch with most of them on a. You know, a fairly sort of, you know, you you give them their distance, you give them their space, you know, their time to themselves, but you like to keep in touch with how they're getting on. And yeah, the feedback is that everyone is, you know, everyone's ticking over fine, but it's it's just that chomping at the bit, it's that desperation just to get back to playing football as soon as possible. And unfortunately, that we can't give them any kind of guidance on, you know, don't worry, it'll only be another few weeks, or don't worry, it'll be another few months, or you know, you better get used to it because it might be a year. There's absolutely nothing that we can tell them which would be be hundred percent accurate as to when we expect to be back playing. Unfortunately, but yeah, um, yeah they're. They're they're fine. They're doing well. I'm in touch with Ronnie pretty much on a you know a daily basis anyway. Um, and, and Mark, probably, Mark and Mike. 
we had a unique way of doing player of the year this year, didn't we? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we we got the guys together. So obviously we did the online vote for the supporters player of the year for the very first time, which worked really well. Obviously, we unfortunately we can't take votes in person. Uh, I know guys that aren't online would have missed out, but unfortunately, it's just the way it is. Uh, at the moment and um, so we then did the announcement we felt that we wanted to get uh, just a, a reason to get the guys together more than anything else to to have a chat and just to see how everyone was and get them to to see each other and keep in touch with each other see each other's faces again so we did the announcements on uh, online and a, and a zoom call amongst ourselves and after some technical teeth and problems uh, we managed to, to have a, a wee announcement and and let the guys know who'd taken the awards this year. Yeah, in terms of voting, there was quite a number of votes, and it was particularly close this year, wasn't it? The, the, the supporters previous. won, yeah. The, the players won wasn't so. Uh, Gordy McNabb won that quite comprehensively. Um, but the supporters player of the year, yeah, was really close. I think it came down to, I think, three or four points between Gordy, who won that one, and Carl Medney, who was second. And Adam Porritt was a few points back in third. Yeah, all this, all loads of deserving candidates this year. Really, it was it was good to see. But what kind of takes us on to to footballing matters in general? Uh, and as we speak, we know that the Highland League's been called, and it's been called on existing positions. Mm-hmm. Um, how do you feel as director of football? Where do you think we would have finished, or how many points do you think we could have accrued? All of them. Yeah, you know, all of them. Yeah. <laughs> and this oh, day next year we'll be champions. No, <laughs> I don't know if it's really fair to speculate because football, it's, it's it's sports. You know, it's a great unknown. Anything can happen uh, on any given any given match day. It's unfair to say, you know, that we would have guaranteed to beat this team, or you know, we would have guaranteed to take points out of that game, but. From my point of view, I always look to win every single game at the end of the day. I don't feel there's any, you know, why would you look at going into a game and thinking, you know, let's just get a point here. When then you go 2-0 up, what are you going to do if you're 2-0 up? Just quite happily concede two and go take your point. No, <laughs> you, go and, you go and try and win. So I think it's probably unfair on maybe a bit disrespectful to other teams to, to speculate and say, but the sort of ambition was there to, to accrue as many points as we could. And I think we were quite quite close to a few of the teams above us. We're certainly in touch with teams around about us in the league. So, you know, if, if things had been different, we might have might have been able to to close a gap on teams with our games in hand. That kind of takes us on to perhaps a, a further question for you. But what's your highlights of last season when you, you look back at some of the games? Oh, what they? Quite a few. I think the way we played at home against what you would say the top teams was was quite pleasing. We beat Brora uh, at the start of the season. I think the way we started the league season was really satisfi- satisfying as well. It allowed, we had, I think we, we had the free week really early, which allowed us to float under the radar a little bit because it meant as much as I think we had a 100% record for the first four games. Was it four games? We played uh, Huntley away, Devonville away, Rothes yeah. away, and Brora at home and we beat them all. But other teams had played five games. So we had won four out of four and teams had won five out of five. But to beat Broda, obviously who just steamrolled teams this year was was really satisfying. It was a you know a real humdinger of a game at Station Park. It was a clacker of a game, yes. That was a that was a real high point. We obviously then had the centenary of our first ever Highland League fixture against Fraserburgh, another top team. And we the the way that game panned out, obviously two 0 down and come back and come score back. two two eight goals to get a two two draw and just a sense of occasion at the game as well was was a, a high point and um, more recently the the Inverurie locals game as well. I mean, think that's yeah. the, top, the top three teams, seven points at home like against it. the top three teams. Hmm. So yeah, they were kind of like the highlights on on the field. If you like off the field, it was. I thought it was uh, fantastic to see Alex uh, Scoosh McIntosh get recognised by the Nair Sports Council with a Volunteer of the Year award. Um, I think long overdue recognition for Scoosh for uh, all the effort that he puts in to, to fundraising for the club and, and all the, the just the little jobs that he does that if he didn't do, when no you one talk else about would. behind the scenes, yeah. When you talk about behind the scenes, it's mm-hmm. Scoosh McIntosh is the archetypal, isn't he? The, yeah, absolutely. The for the club. I don't know the last time the club was recognised by an award from the Nair Sports Council, but I certainly think Scoosh was a, a, a very well-deserved recipient. 
So they sell them any of Arsenal tickets when they pick it up? Maybe, aye. <laughs> uh, and I think um, bringing Scott Davidson in was a, a step in the right direction for us as well. That was um, that was one that we worked really hard on. Uh, it took a long time to, to conclude to get it over the line, but it, it shows that, that players of that calibre are willing to come to the club and that can only bode well for us for the future. It's an absolute credit to to what Ronnie and yourself and the team as a whole have done, to be honest, that we can attract such players as Scotty and, and the boys that we've got as a whole. <laughs> so let me take you back then, Glenn, because you're like me. You've got Learn County running in your family, running, running in your blood. Um, what, well, what's your first memory of County? What's, what's your first memory of Golden State? Oh, you're going, going back now, Ian. Um, probably... <laughs> maybe maybe. <laughs> I, I think I was about five years old when I was taken along to my first game in a sort of 1992 I would think uh, I guess obviously things were a bit more well, obviously when you're five years old you don't really appreciate it at the time but things are a lot more bleak if you like we were surrounding the the club and uh, a bit of, in a bit of peril at the time but yeah I remember going along and I remember kicking a ball about at the, on the hill behind the goals, um, getting on to take penalty kicks at half-time as well with the subs, those little things. Yeah. Um, swinging on the barrier. Any players that from that time? Um, the players you, you so first play. players that I remember, like, so obviously the manager himself, uh, Ronnie, uh, played in uh, the you're state. Just saying that for oh, I've, got, <laughs> I've got to mention him. Um, <laughs> Ronnie, the likes of um, Dane Miller, uh, Morris McMillan, uh, the late Reynold Cameron, uh, guys like this, Martin mm. Bell, Martin Bell, who mm-hmm. later went on to later went on to play for Martin when uh, for Dingers. Yeah, he was our coach um, mm-hmm. with the the under 18s for for a number of years. Um, a lot of really good players, actually. You know, maybe wasn't the most successful time in the club's history, but you know, guys that turned up every week for next to nothing. Guys that probably paid to play for us. You know, yeah. buying raffle tickets and lucky sevens and all that for in return for you know a pound a week wage or whatever it happened to be, mm-hmm. and guys that you know if they didn't have that kind of commitment and that willingness to turn up, then we wouldn't be here today uh, with a cup at all. Absolutely. So, yeah, um, those days I remember, I remember that. I remember you know going in team bus to to away fixtures and that as well. I was a a young lad. Any and, games stand out for you? What's that? Any, Any games? games? <laughs> None that I can particularly remember. I remember being at Devon Vale. I can remember being down at Lossie Mouth for games on the bus. I remember being at Nairn, a game against uh, Wick, and Nairn having a penalty kick. And I think the goalkeeper saved the penalty, but went the player who took it went for the rebound and was fouled. And another penalty got given. And, a, <laughs> and the second penalty got put over the bar. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of my kind of earliest memories, and I think that was... Kind of, I tell you something. I was I was talking to your dad Kenny today, mm-hmm. about, and um, I asked him this question, so I'll ask you this as well. Um, what's the first thing you remember County winning? In terms of a trophy or a corner yeah, kick? Not just a game. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, the first is the um, the North of Scotland Cup in two thousand and five. That's a day that will live with me forever. I remember being at university. Yeah, I was at university at the time, first year at uni, and. Uh, we played uh, we played Wick Academy in the semi final on a Wednesday night, and we beat them I think four two in extra time. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to go because I was down in Ed- living in Edinburgh at the time. But I remember f- following that game on my phone. I think through text updates. I think this was before you got <laughs> signed to Twitter and live updates and that people were texting you the score, and like just being absolutely delighted that we had a final. And and you know your thoughts. I remember thinking at the time, as long as we score a goal, that's of significance, whether it be a goal to go in front or an equaliser or something to some, give us something to cheer in the final, then I'll be happy whatever way it goes. Because I think we, you know, we were playing Forest at the time, who were, you know, had a fantastic, fantastic Thank side you. under Pelly Parson. And then, you know, because I think we'd been in three semi finals, I think, in the previous seas, previous couple of seasons, we got beat by Rothis in the North Cup semi final, we'd been beaten by Cali in an Inverness Cup semi final, we'd been beaten on penalties by Clark in an Inverness or I think a North of Scotland Cup semi final the year before. So it was almost one of those ones where you're thinking this is never going to happen. And so to get to the final was like m- monumental for me at that time, I remember. And then the day was just, you know, it was an unbelievable um, day. I can, st- I can name you the team that was starting 11 off the top of my head as well. It's in short number order. So how much it's like, how much the day is like cemented in my memory. But I just remember 
you know, guys like um, David McRae scored twice and Martin Sanderson scored the, the second goal. And guys like mm-hmm. guys that had been there for years, like well, you know, guys like Willie Barron and Ian Brooks and that guys that I'd, I'd kind of grown up watching. Guys that you know, I mentioned the guys that were playing in the early nineties when I first went along. But when I started going as a, you know, when I was in my kind of early teens, when I started really taking notice of the players and you know, guys like Scott Kelleher, Ian Brooks. Guys that had been there for years, and to see you know those guys lift a trophy it was you know just a fantastic day all round. <laughs> uh, it's good days, good days indeed. Well, uh, let's take it on a bit then, because uh, the the first time I guess you and I really worked with each other on, on, on any sort of thing was was over the the fans fundraising. Yeah. But, before that, you'd already been involved with the writing of the centenary book, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. which I have a copy of here. <laughs> <laughs> and I believe I know, this this my copy, Glenn. I don't know if you can see this on the podcast. I'll hold it up there. Oh, yeah. You signed it for me. Yeah, it <laughs> tell, tell us about how you got involved with that. I think it was always really something in the back of my head that I wanted to do. You know, you're conscious of the centenary coming up, and from a young age, or a, a young, relatively young age, um, given that my degree that I studied was journalism and, and I'd been involved in writing match reports as as kind of work experience for for that, then it's something that was always always something that was in my head. When I, I, I did a lot of work placements at the Nurture Telegraph and had to look up the old papers for the, the chronicled piece that they do and always kind of got sidetracked reading match reports from <laughs> from bygone days instead of looking up news that, that had happened uh, at the time. Well, Donald Wilson's the poet, right? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, and then obviously Donald uh, Donald kind of had the same thoughts and he, he really got the ball rolling with it. Um, and then obviously Bill Logan, who's sadly no longer with us as well, he his his oh, yeah. um, his sort of passion for, for history and local history and his work with the Nair Museum made him a, you know, an ideal fit as well. So, you know, a lot of hard work went into to the book and and I think it took about two and a half years worth of effort nice. to, to take it from that first kind of when we first got his together around Donald's kitchen table to, to actually having the, the launch day uh, at the Playhouse um, in 2014. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it was about two and a half years worth of work and a lot of hours spent going through the microfiche in the, Nairn, uh, in the library, a lot of hours spent at Nair Museum going through the hard copies, the Nairnshire, a lot of time tracking down ex-players and turning up at people's doors, driving to Aberdeen to meet Andy Cadenhead, which was, you know, a real highlight for me given, you know, his how sort of high esteem he's held in, in club history. So that you mentioned the launch there. Yeah. Uh, t- tell us, because I, I remember very fondly that day, the, the people that were there, were, were you thinking of yourself, Donald and Bill, nervous? Were you surprised? Were you, how did you feel that day? Yeah, I was. I remember being very excited. I remember it was one of those ones, like kid before Christmas sort of thing, the night before, not being able to sleep, and then trying to get the books from uh, I O R, who did you know a fantastic work on the design uh, of the book and the the publishing of the book from uh, their shop at the time on Harbour Street, and I thought the suspension of my car wasn't quite going to make it up the the speed bump outside the townhouse because uh, of the weight <laughs> in the boxes of the book it's in the in the book. <laughs> To the playhouse, but yeah, I remember being a bit, and then you know, we were really just delighted with the turnout, with the amount of people, the supporters, and the ex-players, and that came along to to sort of show their support, if you like. And you know, I think I'm pretty certain we were self-published, so we we fronted up, we we sold in advance copies, and I think within a week of it being on sale, it had already broken even. So anything we sold after that was profit for the club, which you know was fantastic. That was the whole idea was to raise a few quid for. For the funds, for the uh, fans yeah. fundraising, but I tell you something, Ian. Uh, um, yeah. I went into a secret. I've I've never read the book for pleasure. I've never sat down <laughs> since it was published. I've never sat and read it. No, I proofread it numerous times before it was published. Um, <laughs> I spent. I remember a bank holiday weekend, spending twelve hours a day um, over the three oh. days just reading it for yeah. spelling mistakes. And I quite often use it for reference if I need to check something. Yeah, but um, I've never I've never sat down and read it cover to cover since it's come out, no. Maybe one oh. day. You'll need to too, get I think I'm I think I'm too scared <laughs> I'll uh, I'm too scared of spot a spell <laughs> mistake or something. You'll need to get the audio version. Maybe yeah. Uh, you can dictate it. <laughs> no, I don't think I'm the man for that. <laughs> <laughs> um 
So you mentioned the the uh, as part of the funds fundraising, and that that kind of takes me on to the next topic I wanted to talk about. Because uh, as I say, we we worked together in the past on the funds fundraising again with Donald Wilson, with Bill Logan, Tony Blair, Marley Nickel, all these people, and a lot lot more. Tell us a bit about that, and also the part that the the fans themselves play in the county. How do you see the the role of the fans? Um. Yeah, I think that looking at the fan, the, the fundraising effort in, uh, well, I suppose it's still ongoing, really. Um, I think what it showed was that there is a a great amount of goodwill for the football club throughout the town, throughout the wider community. You know, if the guys that are, you know, if you're saying it's for an Iron County and, you know, people are putting their hands in their pocket, uh, the panel beaters was, you know, unbelievable. The the money that that took in was, you know, the, the, the amount of people as well. It wasn't like one guy giving you four figures to cover it it was like you know hundreds of people giving 20 quid 40 quid whatever it was for a name or two on the board and it, you know he's you can see the, the names are there you can see it's testament to the the generosity of the the supporters and just the you know the wider community as well the, the people that have had family connections that have played for the club or family connections that were supporters i think the fans are really just, you know, it's easy to say, oh, you know, the fans are the lifeblood of the club or, you know, there'd be no club without the fans. But I think you can, there's, there's, there's a tangibility when you say that with, with ourselves because if there was no supporters, there were no money coming in from gate receipts, there was no money coming in from advertising boards and the club would be bust effectively. Um, the fans do keep it going. The more supporters turn up on a Saturday, the more, the, the better health we are financially. You know, the, the, as I say, the, the, business, the local businesses that support, uh, sponsor a board or, or take advertising space at the park, people that sponsor the players, um, people that are signed up to the, the fans fund. Um, the recent one is the the data ticket, the, the data ticket scheme, which has you know, raised over a thousand pounds already, and it's only been going for a week. It's just amazing the amount of um, goodwill that's out there and. Yeah, I suppose the more that comes and the more people are able to help, then the better it is for for the football club, the better it is for for us in terms of putting a a team that, that people deserve on the park. And the more we can give, give to the players, the better environment we can create for the players, then that makes the players happen, respond in, in turn, if you like. It makes the players more... Absolutely in tune with what we're trying to do and it allows us to, to bring in better calibre of players when the opportunity comes as well. Uh, 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 as you say, I mean, it's you can come out with the, the stock phrases quite easy about it being uh, the lifeblood of the club and all that, but there's a real investment in the club, and I don't just mean by uh, financial, it's an investment from the community in the club. The, mm. you, you'll get it the same as anybody else um, on the committee when you go. We go down the street, people are asking about how's the club doing, how's this player, how's the Angelese, are you going to win next week? There's a real, there's a pride in that club, which is which is great to see and which you want to give back to, don't you? Yeah, absolutely. And I think the, you know, the, one of the best people say, you know, you ask the question, how can people support the club? And the easiest and the, one of the most effective ways is just turn up on a Saturday and uh, yeah. and cheer the team on. The players, players respond to positive energy from the, from the terraces and the more people that are there generating that positive energy the better for us um, be it at home or away um, from speaking to I know Dodo Graham keeps track of the attendances and they're, you know, they're on the increase which is great um, the attendances have been start all no time for that <laughs> <laughs> he's, got, he's got his records of how many people come through the gate and that's on the increase over the, the last sort of four or five years which is fantastic to see it's just steadily getting increasing and the more people come along then the better it is that you know the more as i say the more positivity you have on the ground for for wanting the team to do well on a saturday then the more chance we've got getting a result in my eyes yeah so what i was going to ask you about you you're on the committee you're the i know you're the director of the club uh, and you've got this title director of the football mm -hmm. and i know i know i know from working with it it's a wide expansive role maybe tell the folks exactly what a director of football does what's what do you do at the club what's your role it's quite yeah it's very wide ranging Ian. a lot of logistics 
uh, making sure people are in the right place at the right time when they're supposed to be as tired as they're supposed to be, making sure we've got somewhere to train, all that kind of stuff. Kind of the boring stuff, if I like to call it. But <laughs> the stuff that keeps you busy, stuff that keeps you up at night. Um, but a lot of like looking at the bigger picture as well, or trying to look at the bigger picture. I suppose my probably my biggest fault is I get too drawn into the, the result on a Saturday, being the be-all and end-all. Ronnie's very good at being. Oh, Ronnie's very good at being not getting too high when we win and not getting too low when we get beat. I'm kind of the opposite, which is you know a fault, uh, you know a kind of a flaw of mine in, in in that respect. But yeah, you're looking at the bigger picture, trying to man, uh, maintain everything along the same sort of lines. We've got obviously numerous youth teams, uh, under twenties, under seventeens, under fifteens, under thirteens. There's no use if they're all going off and doing their own thing, and and, and you know one team is approaching it one way and one team's approaching it the other way. You've got to make sure everything's aligned to what Ronnie wants to do in the first team so that it makes the player progression a lot easier. So making sure that's that's done properly. Uh, having an overview of the players at all levels, I probably could name you a good chunk of players at the club and what position they play and what strengths and weaknesses are down to about maybe the under 15s. I could you know, trying to cut a, a sort of comprehensive overview of all the players. Um, looking at opposition, uh, keep track of every team we play, uh, who plays, who doesn't play, what positions they play, what formations they play. I know Ronnie keeps, keeps that sort of records as well. Uh, looking who plays for other teams. If you see someone's out of a team, then, you know, take a mental note of it. Having a good knowledge of uh, different players in different positions that that might be able to strengthen our squad so if the manager says you know we maybe need a new player in position x then you can straight away reel off three names that that might be potentially ones that we could go and target um, dealing with contract negotiations with the players keeping an eye on you know it'd be kind of negligent if you like to allow players that we want to keep to run contracts too close to expiry date you know keeping in touch with the players as well you know i'm in regular contact with most of the players all, all the players in sort of semi-regular contact um if they need anything they know you know the kind of thing they need a, if they've got a football question ask ronnie if they've got a question about anything else then ask me that's kind of the way we do it yeah so the contract negotiations if we're looking to sign a player myself and ronnie will speak to them um, Ronnie will talk to them about where they fit into the team I'll talk to them about the club and how it's run and how how they'll be treated with us, all that kind of stuff mm-hmm. so it's yeah, as you say, it's, it's quite wide ranging but um, you know I, I do do kind of make a point of uh, keeping my distance if you like, you know, it's not my decision who plays on a Saturday, it's not my decision who we sign, it's not my decision who we sell that's the manager's decision, that we pay a manager to do that and he's got his coaching staff as well but if he asks for my opinion, I'll, you know, quite happily give it. But he doesn't have to listen to it. He doesn't have to implement anything I I say in that regard. It's you know that's entirely his remit. But you know, I've, as I say, I'm I'm there as a sounding board if if required as well. Which which kind of takes me back to when we, if you like, you and I and, and quite a few others first started uh, uh, with a. Or a quite intensive involvement with the committee about, say about four or five years ago now. I remember I start of a particular season, we had very few signed players coming into the season uh, when Zoni came in. Tell us about that that period and how you approached building the squad up from that. Yeah, from that so position. I think we had Broad on at home in the opening day of the season, 2016. And we were training on the Tuesday night and obviously we had a lot of stuff going on by the scenes and it's kind of well documented. We have no, pre- no proper pre-season at all. Um, players moving on and that's fine, that's football, these things happen. But, you know, we had guys that were we'd taking guys in from the under-20 squad and we'd had guys in on trial and we were at training and I counted the number of signed first-team players that were there. So excluding the trials and excluding the ones that were had been roped in from the the youth squad, and I think there was like half a dozen there. So you're, you're thinking, gee, was, there a, was there a danger of you pulling your boots on again? For the- <laughs> no, I don't think it got that extreme. <laughs> but uh, I think Ronnie would be be in line before I would. But uh, no, it was a case of just trying to get the guys. You know, we'd, we'd, Ronnie was kind of assessing a few guys, I think, like so if, um, we got Gary Carr, Callum Riddle, we got Jason Maganti, who was, you know, these were guys that were fantastic for us. 
great about the dressing room and great on the park as well. Took in uh, Jamie Mackay, Novo again, uh, Chris Moyer, guys that had been at the club before and felt maybe they had a point to prove coming back as well. So, you know, Stephen McKenzie was another one. It was just a case of bringing in guys to put a team in the park and, and try and mould it into a, a, a successful team as much as we could using what we already had left. I think the seven that, that stayed were... Cal McLean and Kenny McKenzie obviously still with us. Uh, we had Dylan McLean, we had Jordan McRae, we had uh, Wayne Martintosh, uh, we had Greg Main as well, but he was injured, and we had Glenn Main too. So, you know, uh, and Ross Naismith, I think I did like, mention him. But yeah, we're, you know, you're kind of eternally grateful to the players that, that stayed at that point, you know, without whom. Grateful, that's actually. Yeah, and then you had the likes of your, like Jack McLean came up from the 20s. So I've mentioned Jordan, you had uh, Carl Medney as well that came in and, and debuted for us. And, you know, guys that have gone on and done well, you know, like how well Jordan's done, for example. Yeah. It's, uh, it was quite a season. Uh, I remember that game against Glover well. Uh, quite a crowd yeah. we had that as well, I seem to remember. <laughs> yeah, when you go 1-0 down after two minutes or whatever it was, you're kind of fearing the worst. I think we had Willie Barron back, of course, as well for six months playing for us and Came straight in. I think he trained once and played centre mid. At, like he was in his mid thirties or something at the time. But I think the poor guy was in in bed for the next three days with sore legs. But you know, you're really grateful to the guys for for giving that up and and you know coming and pulling on the boots because it could have got messy. Like I say, you know, you're yeah. playing Brora and you think, you know, where are we? You know, we're pulling a team together here. I mean, this could be this could yeah. be a, a real doing. Um, but you know, I think we avoided. I don't think we really got any you know, massive, really bad ones. A few sort. I think Forrest was a sore one. Bucky, Bucky, yeah, Bucky was a string. Yeah, it was about. I think it finished eight, eight three. Was it? We, eight, just, three, yeah. we got three goals and decided we could pull it back to eight all in the last five minutes, I think, or something in that <laughs> game. But uh, Forrest away was a bad one as well. But apart from that, you know, the guys. You know, you're you're always grateful to these guys that that came in and. And pulled the boots on and did your turn. Now we, we we've talked about a few of the of the good times in the past. Then uh, I, I just wanted to touch on some of the some of the challenging things that, that have happened. And one in particular, you mentioned the name there, which he was a great boy, Carlin Little. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm sure you would agree that was one of the lowest times we've had. Yeah, absolutely. Time. Yeah, without, Could you tell you know, us a bit about Callum, what sort of boy he was? Oh, he was full of life, um, bubbly, loved football, just, you know, loved being around the guys. You know, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't his closest friend. He's got, you know, he had far closer friends than, than me and family. But, yeah, he was, he was. I knew him a long time. Played together in the Boys Brigade many moons ago when primary school. Played at St. Ninian together. Just a really chirpy guy and a good player as well. A really good yeah, midfielder. People forget that he was a really decent player. Good midfielder, he could hit a hell of a free kick and he could play in defence as well. I think Ronnie hadn't put up front at one point as well. He could put himself about up there. I just loved the, the rough and tumble, if you like, of, of playing football. You know, just a real enthusiasm. He used to, I remember he used to work offshore um, when we were at St. Ninian and he'd get the train back on a training night. And he'd come, if he was coming back on shore, he'd get the train and the train would get into there and he'd be straight to the show field. He wouldn't even go home, just straight to training at the oh. show field. Yeah. Um, just loved, loved a wind up, loved, uh, loved a laugh and a joke, and you know, loved just everything about. I suppose being a footballer. Uh, that uh, the one of the the last times I was I was talking to Callum, I don't know, you would have been there at the time. We went through a tariff, and it was when Callum was undergoing his treatment and he was mm-hmm. wearing his patch and his eye and whatnot. Uh, and the the tariff manager asked him if he wanted to lead the teams out. Mm-hmm. Do you remember this? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I remember that day. Yeah. Uh, Carl and, and Callum said, yes, absolutely, we'd lead the teams out, but only if you could nick the chairman's hat. That's right, yeah. <laughs> so, he led the teams out wearing Donald's. <laughs> yeah, a funny yeah, man. Absolutely, so, that's yeah. A, Just, that's a good one. I think um, one thing that I don't think a lot of people know about as well, after he passed away, I think Ronnie, we had did it really well with the squad. Um, we trained... I can't remember if it was the very next day, next night, or the, the, the two nights, whenever we trained the next time after. And pulled them all in, and we had sat them down and had a really just open chat with the players and, and let them say anything they want to say as well in the dressing room. And we just had a really light-hearted training session as well, just doing extra drills in threes and fours that try to keep the ball in the air as long as possible. And, and you know, 
and Callum would have loved all that kind of stuff because he would give the boy who if you if you were the one that would let the ball drop, you would be getting pelters from him. And then <laughs> at the end, at the end of the session, he did a Ronnie did a game and it was the boys from Nairn against the boys from Inverness. And like Callum would have that as well. He'd treat it like the World Cup final if, if he did that. <laughs> he'd be calling all the Inverness boys every name under the sun as well. Yeah. And you know, obviously at the time we had his good friend Paul McGuire, that was one I forgot to mention earlier. Yeah, who was you know, so a lot of guys like Paul and Wayne and Greg and Glenn that were quite close to to calm involved with the squad and I know obviously you know it's really difficult for them and, and difficult for his obviously friends and family far more difficult than it ever was for me being um, you know being them guys being so close to him He was a hell of a boy and we miss him still we, we, we do miss him still so let's turn now to the, the, some of the high points then what have been your gains over the past, say the past four years what are the ones that spring to the mind yeah I was actually Boy. thinking about this the other day actually Obviously, I think the most obvious one is the Huntley away game in the first season, the 6-4 <laughs> Which game. Which one? Six, <laughs> the 6-4 game was just, it was unbelievable um, to be, what was it, 3-1 down. And then That's what I was going to say, for the folks who oh, maybe don't down. know about it, it's legendary and known, but to tell the folks how that game went. <laughs> well, we were terrible for first half an hour. Uh, we find ourselves 3-0 down. I remember thinking at the time that 3-0 was harsh. Um, maybe that's me looking through it through my yellow tinted glasses, but um, and we got one back. Ross Naismith scored just before half time. We got one back. We think right, we're had on a second here. If we can get another one back, we're in the game here. But then and, and did we? I can't even remember how the score went. Actually, um, I think we did. We get back to three two, and then they scored straight away yes. after that. One of the other, and then four two. I think oh, that's it, dead and buried. And then we got back to, we just kept fighting and fighting, and got back to four four. And then I remember just talking about it afterwards and, you know, we'd fought and scrapped back from 3-1 down to 4-4 and Ronnie and Mike were, I think, we were sort of discussing about along the lines of what we do. We shut, shut up shop and take a point. And I was like, no, to hell, we'll go and win the game. <laughs> and then I, I, I know, I know put us uh, 5-4 up. And then yeah. uh, at the time, I remember Huntley had the, must be the thinnest goal posts in the world. They've now been, <laughs> they've now been replaced. I remember the ball broke to Jason Morganti at the back post and he side-footed it. There was no goalie or no defender and he side-footed it off this post and I don't think he could do it again if he tried. <laughs> and uh, and that's and it's bounced out and been cleared and you know, that's at five. I think we were five four after the time. I think that would have just put the seal on it. But then um, Dylan McKenzie came off the bench and, and scored the sixth goal in, the, in, the, I think in the last minute and that was just you know, a, a great a great moment. So... Yeah, that for that in the first year. I remember we went to Wick in the first year and and scalped them. I think five. We beat them five one up there, That's which was right. yeah. This is a real a real highlight. And um, then the second season we beat we beat Bucky early on when they were the champions. Max. Uh, Max scored in uh, <laughs> yeah in the first minute or something. <laughs> beat them. Yeah, that was that was really memorable. Or Jordan scored a penalty. Jack McLean scored and beat three two through there. Max scored yeah and really late. If I can um, share the story about that game, but, um, as I say, that was Bucky, a great team, the, the champions at that point. Um, and the Bucky, I love going to Bucky because they're, they're very welcoming and the committee is lovely and hardworking. Um, so they, they, they congratulated us, myself and Donald, the chairman, walked down into the boardroom to, as you do after the game, shake hands. And they came up and they shook all their hands and they said, Congratulations, boys, did really well. But understandably, they, they left. I've never hugged the chairman so much in my life. <laughs> <laughs> it was unbelievable. Max feelings. These are the, the things that put a smile on your face. Yeah, that was that was a good day as well. There's you know, there's a few as I mentioned this season. The year sort of last year we had Jordan, he really took off in the second half of the season. He was almost winning games single handed for us or, or getting points. There was a game at Wednesday night at Keith and we came back and drew and he literally dragged us over the line and uh, we beat Fraser at home three now, he scored a hat trick as well. So yeah, those were memorable games. Those are the ones that, 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 that kind of, Yeah, that was the ones that kind of stick in the mind for the last few seasons, yeah. <laughs> so I guess as we, we move towards the, the the end of this cast, Glenn, what's the future hold? What's the what, what's the the blue sky thinking for Nan King? Well, well as you mentioned at the start, we're really kinda well, just I suppose life's on hold at the moment, football and life in general, until we get back playing, there's not there's not a lot we can say. We're always looking to improve. We're always looking to progress. Uh, I think we're well positioned. 
um, in terms of the playing squad. You know, the average age of the squad is good. Um, we've only got a couple. It's almost. It's good for a few years down the line. It's almost detrimental to us now. But we've only got, I think, two players in the thirties. We've got Glenn Rain and Adam Naismith. Might be wrong. Might be others. But so it, it, the point I'm making is, it's a very young squad. But the good thing is, it's they're building up their experience. If you take Dylan McKenzie as an example. Dylan's 21 and he's played for four seasons for us because he came to us when he was 17. So he's got like over 100 appearances and his belt. Max is the same. Max has got, I think, played over 100 games for us now. He's, he's very close to it. He's played for, for three seasons and he's, you know, he started at 16. You mentioned that back he came and he was still at Nair Academy when he scored that goal. That's um, right, man. It's, so, you know, it's a case of trying to keep these guys together and develop them and, and gain experience for them but at the same time you, the guys you, you need to bring in a bit of uh, experience a bit of calibre um, to go with it I mentioned Scott Davidson at the top as being someone that's that's played in the league for a number of seasons for a number of different clubs and and done well for them all but he's only I think 25 and then you've got like sort of the guys we've got that are you know your Adam Porritts or your Callum McLeans and your Kenny McKenzie's these guys are still in their mid-20s um, as well so you look at it and you think we're pretty well positioned I would say with regards to the squad you know Gordy McNabb is another one of have overlooked he's just turned turned 30 this year as well so you're looking at it and you think we're pretty uh, well positioned but at the same time we're conscious of the gap that needs to be bridged if we want to really challenge you look at two of the last few games that we played before we stopped, uh, we went to Brora. In fact, three. We went to Brora at Christmas time, and that was relentless. Picking the ball off them at well, times, you know, um, yeah, unbelievable. Yeah. That was the best. That was the best performance I've seen this season. Um, we went to Fraserburgh, and they were very good as well. We, I think, we got a flight with three one, but and we the for Martin game, the very last game, they were very good that day for Martin. I, I don't think it was maybe our, our best day, to put it lightly, but, um, <laughs> but for Martin, we're, we're very, very good. And you look at that and you think, that is the level we should be aspiring to. So you learn from those games, don't you? The boys learn. From- yeah, the players need to aspire to that sort of level. The players need to look at it and think, you know, if I want to be remembered as a good Highland League player, that's the sort of performances I need to put in week in, week out. I need to match that. You know, by and the, the way you get there is by by working hard, by listening to what the coaches have got to say, all that kind of stuff. We say, oh no, they don't need me to preach, preach that to them. You know, as I say, you know, you've asked about the role, and one of the things we do do a lot of work on is, you know, we look at the character of the player and the back, do a bit of, a bit of background work on a player before we bring them in and make sure they're going to be the right fit. We don't want to upset the apple cart if you want in the dressing room. So yeah, the players all know that these, these are the sort of levels we need to get to. You look at. You know, you look at a guy like uh, that was with us previously, like Sid Mackay, who's you know must be in his sort of late thirties now, and he's starting to wind down. Good. But the amount yeah. of goals that guy scored, and the amount of games he's played, and you know the way he looks after himself, you know, there's no reason why. You know, every, fair enough, people have a knack for getting a goal, or have a, you know people have got you know great skills or you know naturally gifted. But in terms of looking after yourself, there's there's no reason why you can't players can't look after themselves the same sort of manner as you know these these guys and you know that's as I say that's the bridge that's the gap that we have to as a club collectively we're not just putting the emphasis on the players it's collectively behind the scenes as well to try and bridge to to put that sort of performances in and I think you know we're not a million million miles away from it it's just about consistency you know as I mentioned at the start in the highlights from the season we've you know we've proven we've beaten Broda we've beaten Inverurie we've drawn with uh, Fraser all at home as well so you know the guys have shown that they can go out there and, and do it but you know it'd be nice if we we seem to have a knack of uh, of going through a rut in the autumn time I don't know why uh, worried about when the clocks change we, uh, yeah, we seem to awesome. we don't like um, we don't like playing sort of Halloween time or uh, bonfire <laughs> night that sort of time of year um, but then we seem to have a we seem to like the turn of the year and then getting into the springtime again. So maybe we should maybe we should all just play summer football. Summer football. We'd win the <laughs> but, uh, league slip like <laughs> but no um, 
Yeah, the aspirations is always supposed. You know, you look at where you are, and you look at you look at where you've been, and you think, right, we need to be better. We need, and how do we how do we improve? And that's that's everyone from myself to down to the the management team. I know the management team are always looking at what they've done in training and what they've the way they've approached games. And if it hasn't worked, then right, how do we change it? How do we how do we improve the next time? And you know, I think everyone's got to be be the same. I think you're absolutely spot on, the, the, the game. And, and also off the park, there's been some exciting developments quite recently, hasn't there? Yeah, so we've managed to bring Zion Energy in as our digital partner, our first digital partner. And there's been a, a fair bit of work put into that as well. So yeah. the kind of discussions have been ongoing since the start of the year with um, the CEO of Zion Energy, a gentleman called Alistair Caithness, who's originally from Inverness, but now based in San Diego. So we've um, concluded a deal with uh, Zion Energy to become uh, the digital partner of, of Nairn County Football Club going forward or the first digital partner. Uh, there'll be other opportunities for, for businesses to, to strike a similar deal with us if, and we'll maybe have news on that going forward. But Alistair's um, really enthusiastic. He's really keen. He's full of ideas as well. So himself and uh, his business or one of his business associates, uh, Douglas Ramsey from Acker Solutions, um, who's actually Cohen Ramsey's uncle, uh, are going to be coming on board with the management committee, and they bring um, they bring a skill set I think that we don't have uh, in terms of the management committee. You know, adds a, to use a phrase that adds another string to our bow, and hopefully the um, supporters will see a lot of uh, new ideas and, and a bit of innovation going forward. I think you know they. I think what really struck uh, Alistair from our discussions was, you know, the the community aspect of the club and all the work that's been done with um, with the efforts over the the last few few weeks and months. Um, so that, you know, a real kind of feather in our cap to to bring bring Zion on board, and we're really excited to to be working with Alistair going forward, and really keen to to get going if you like to to see what what they can bring to the table. As I'm sure it'll be be really beneficial I think you know we're really conscious of the fact that the way people interact with a football club now is a lot different to what it was um, 20 30 years ago even 10 years ago I mentioned there when I was trying to keep track of scores when you know in 2005 you know 15 years ago even then you know the world's changed and it will continue to change and evolve and I think it's really important that as a football club we do the same um, that we give people we give people that you know, but you mentioned there the couple of new ideas that, uh, that well, the many new ideas. Mm-hmm. Zion of, of the podcast has come out of that, and I believe there's a, a TikTok social media account now. For yeah, so yeah, just um, started that recently, so there'll be you know, a wee bit of news on, or uh, there has been a wee bit of news on that. So yeah, it's just um, just another avenue for for supporters to to keep in touch with what's going on. TikTok's the most widely used social media platform amongst under twenty threes these days, so. You know, I'm I'm kind of unfortunately out with that bracket uh, quite <laughs> by quite a bit. Maybe not as much as you, but by, by a wee bit now. But you know, it does make me feel like I've gone full circle because I remember when I was when I was young, uh, when I was of school age, there was a new thing called the internet with websites and forums and chat rooms on it that the club wanted to uh, harness, if you like, and and didn't know how. So that's where I got involved and helped. And now I'm. On the other side of the fence, there's this new thing called, uh, you know, this this kind of platform where um, the younger generation, if you like, are involved in, um, you know, it's... And I, 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 I know with the, because I'm with you, when I was young, they were painting pictures on walls of caves, but <laughs> uh, I, I know that with the, the TikTok account and with our social media in general, we're looking to get some some of the younger generation, uh, if we can call them that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if it... Um, involved, some new ideas. Yeah, there's no point in there's no point in, in someone who's out with that demographic coming up with ideas for things that appeal to that demographic. The idea, you know, the the ideal way to run it would be to get someone who is or to bring people to the table who are under twenty three years old or, you know, people that are school age or what have you have got ideas because, you know, they're everyone at that age is so tech savvy, so quick at doing uh, stuff on their phones, on on tablet, on on their laptops, what have you, and the tools are out there these days as well. Free downloads, is there's not it doesn't take much effort. So yeah, it's we'll hopefully be looking to to add a few more individuals of that age because there's no, as I say there's no point in 
the people that are out with that demographic being the ones to to um, to instigate things when when you can bring people in that can do right. that. I mean, there's you know we've got we've got a YouTube channel, we've got um, as I say TikTok, we've got already got Facebook, Instagram, Twitter accounts as well. It's just given as many different people the the way of interacting with the football club and keeping up to date with what's going on at the football club. Of course, the the more traditional means of uh, disseminating information is still important. It's important that we retain, you know, a, a good working relationship with the Nurture Telegraph, which you know we've been been really keen to you know, develop over the last few years as well to keep people that like to buy their paper um, informed as well. So um, people have different ways of getting their news and keeping in touch with the things they're interested in nowadays. And and it's important that we as a club recognise that and keep up with that. And I think uh, you're spot on there. And just as we wind up, uh, uh, I've, I've liked talking to you about what's happening in the future because in these in these days of lockdown and and with all that's happened with the pandemic, it can be it can be easy not to think about the future and think about what can what can happen. And the good days will absolutely come again. So, Glenn, listen, mate, I have enjoyed vastly talking to you. I could talk to you about football. <laughs> So thank you for coming on. No uh, problem. I hope you've enjoyed it. And no doubt we'll, we'll talk to you again. Yeah. But, uh, well, what we'll do is we'll wind it off for now. Thanks once again to Zion Energy, our new digital partners for the County Football Club. I hope folks have enjoyed uh, listening in to these two old codgers chatting about Nan County. Uh, please stay safe. And we'll see you again on the next episode of the Nan County Podcast.